So we have a second lecture from Robin Heath today. This one's called A Catalogue of Recent Evidence, The Megalithic Scientist at Work, but also it's called Amazing Things, following on from wonderful things from last night. And this is Robin's uh, look at over uh, well, nearly 40 years of research into the megalithic arts and sciences and where it's come to up to this present day. As you know, with the introduction we gave yesterday and Robin's talk, is written numerous books, one of them with John Michelle, The Measure of Albion, and many other classic tomes. So it gives us great pleasure to welcome Robin Heath. I decided to change the title to something more memorable, to Amazing Things, uh, because the, it's now a century since Lord Carnarvon and Howard Carter uh, found Tutankhamun's burial chamber or penetrated into the chamber to find that it hadn't been raided. And of course, the classic, almost a cliche now, that when Lord Carnarvon said, what do you see? Uh, a sort of gobsmacked Howard Carter said wonderful things. But all those wonderful things were material objects. There were furniture, there were carts and wheels. In fact, the stuff of, of, of any culture, the, the objects it produces to make life easier and, or beautify the home or decorate things. But these are all material things. They are things that are if you like, um, the fluff. And they're amazing. They're, they're <laughs> wonderful things. But the stuff we're dealing with when we go to the megalithic is, goes beyond that. It goes to things that have a, a sort of metaphysical component, if you like. They're, they're, those wagon wheels that the Egyptians must have had a designer who had a ruler and must have been able to make a saw and chisels and and, we, and we have found those. We don't have much to go on in the megalithic because we don't have much hardware about the tool sets or the th thought processes, which are not material things. So I decided to call the lecture Amazing Things because we're now in the, the league of looking at temples and things that have a component that works on us. So although people think I'm all numbers and I'm just a boring person that does just numbers, I like no more than to go to a site and fall asleep at it and take in what it gives me. And I'm changed. And I'm reminded of a person that once gave a lecture here uh, who wrote the definitive book on Chart Cathedral from our point of view, uh, Louis Le Charpentier, uh, which was called um, just Charter, I think, where he points out that the idea of a temple is that it straightens you out. As a human being, you don't even have to have any knowledge or be experienced at anything, but just to go in the presence of it, it has an effect on you. Now, if anybody in this room thinks that they don't have an effect on you, will you put your hand up now, just to make sure we're all tuned into the same radio station? There's no one has put, the, has put their hand up. This means that you believe, you fundamentally believe that by going to visit these sites, that they can change you. And by changing you, it is no evil thing to start trying to delineate, as a scientist, what those qualities are by which that delineation can take part. There are no rules, there's no forbidden zones, nothing. You can decide to measure distances between sites, you can, the height above sea level, there's all, you've got a whole load of data that you personally can go and get with little more than a ruler and possibly a theodolite. Now, I did have in my possession an aluminium 543 triangle, but it's gone. I don't know where it's gone. I must have left it down there. So if I go for a preliminary sighting and I want to see if there's two sites on the horizon are forming a, with where I am, a, a triangle of that sort, of that size, that light polystyrene model, a template, which is template, you know, temple, template, French word, template means a mini temple or a, a, a part of the thing you need to construct a temple. You can put this to your eyes, hold it level, and if you've got a dolmen here and a dolmen here on the two co the corners, 
you're in business and you're standing on a dolmen, it's worth inquiring. It's accurate to about better than a degree and therefore it, it saves you faffing about. Google Earth can save you loads of times but it can't always say what's visible from where. So, I've done 40 years at it. We're not going to get through the whole lot in an hour but we, we, what we are going to do is to uh, have a play and see what other people have said about this very issue. So prepare to, we've got to start off with some quotes. Alexander Tom at a BBC documentary, which is on the web and free and you can watch, it's about an hour long with Magnus Magnusson, was a very good documentary about Professor Tom's work. And you saw the response from archaeologists, some for, some against, and you saw that archaeology was still in the way you had to have an impeccable Cambridge accent or Queen's English accent to be an, uh, an archaeologist. And it was a bit pompous at times. But, but here we have... Ah, oh, look, you found it. Right. So I imagine if this gentleman on the front row here, his head is a dolman, would you like to stand up? <laughs> right, and you walks along there. Whoa! No, you, come back. I'm like, right, I've got the sun in my face, so we know it's a sunset. Right, no, a little further that way. Keep going, four feet that way. Four feet that way, not that height, that, that way. Move towards the end of the room. Who? God, I'm not taking you. Whoa, stand up now. That's it. <laughs> be, an upright, be an upright man, Hugh, you can do it. Now, if I stand here and look along there, I, this is a 512-13 arrangement. It's made out of the sad stuff that made Grenville Towers, polystyrene, wrapped in cheap tape, and it resists rain, it's lightweight, you can take it up a mountain, back of your backpack, look, and you look unusual when you meet people. And it, funny things are said, you've moved. Anyway, that was enough to tell me that that, that there is the basis of a 5, 12, 13 triangle. But it won't be if you is further that way or further this way. It's got, to be, it's got to be along this line here. And to find out whether it is, you've got to go to this gentleman here, stand on his head, and check that you, human's head, is there. Many people would like that. <laughs> no offence. Um, just banter. So, do you get that? This is a tool. Now, in this last year, I'd like to start by saying when this guy says the megalithic circle builders were in many ways my superiors, he's not joking. He's the most qualified engineer you ever met. He's got a doctorate, a doctor of science. That's a, you can't get a higher qualification in this country than that in science. He was head of engineering. He helped build the bouncing bomb, which so, wasn't allowed to tell anybody during his lifetime because it was kept secret after the war how they did that by spinning the ball backwards and rotating it and all of that. That was very, very hush-hush for a while. So this guy was major. He designed flying boats just after the Second World War, which were a big deal then. Uh, and he was responsible for building the biggest ever wind tunnel at Farnborough. He was the, the project's chief engineer. This, we're not talking about a guy that just worked in a university here. We're talking about a guy that built a windmill to power his farm in 1922, that built a water wheel to give his hens uh, enough electricity to give them some light every night so that they would carry on laying, and he built his own house for his family. He was an expert sailor and navigator and was taught by some of the top people like David Clark, the top chap teaching surveying in the period when he was a young man. He went to Canada to work on the railways and designing tunnels that had to meet in the middle from drilling both ends and, and knew when he had to change his socks when they stuck to the wall when he got <laughs> home from work. It's in, it's in his biography. So, oops. So there's another We've got Scotland big. This, our, Ewan Mackay was a good friend of mine, curator of the Hunterian Museum. He was, on, he was pro Tom and lost his professorship, no doubt, because he said things he shouldn't have said and would have told you if he was here now, bless him. Uh, Archaeology prided itself in adopting a multidiscipline approach. 
yet it was not able to adequately, adequately understand or discuss, let alone take on board, the ideas put forward by Professor Tom. This must mean that there is something missing from the education and training of archaeologists. He'd like that, he'd like that. Um, now, if that's the case, then my job is to try and find out what that something missing needs to be. Um, so, I have made one or two f dangerous friends and some friendly friends, but in case anyone thinks that I try to row with people, this will put you right. There's Mike Parker Pearson. You've all seen him on the telly. Well, who said in The Guardian in no, no, November 2020, when we're looking at prehistory, the buried remains are the only evidence we have. Now, there is a clear statement from what is unarguably the top prehistoric archaeologist as far as the BBC is concerned, um, that buried remains are the only evidence we have. Well, they're not the only evidence because a lot of stuff's on the surface. All my work is based on more or less on the surface. They're, they're dolmens, they're the distance apart between them, it's landscape uh, features. And therefore, what he's saying basically, if this is true, is that the, he isn't qualified to judge the sort of work we're doing. It, it needs so, uh, people with other qualities than, than just, you don't dig in a graveyard when you want to find out what's going on in a church, do you? You, you can do, and you're going to find a lot of dead bodies. And that archaeology has been very wrapped up with finding dead things and, and artifacts. But, you know, I think that that statement there is... I think that that's where perhaps we're still in that era where there aren't openings for another set of evidence. So the present direction... Oops. Oops. Um... The present direction of archaeology has intentionally chosen to ignore the above ground connections, geometric relationships, and periodic time periods of the sun, moon, earth, and planets found above the surface of our planet. Many megalithic sites present in their design and metrology the connections that exist between groups of prehistoric monuments. And the point is, I have not the sentence, I haven't room to put it on, but the sentence is that these are mainly incorporating the key time constants as lengths time representing, represented as lengths, about the nature of the sun, moon, earth system, and, and in some cases the fixed stars as well. Most archaeologists presently ignore or refute the findings of megalithic scientists, which is a real thing to say. Now, that Carningley is our sacred mountain, that little <laughs> extinct volcano on the right-hand side, and over here, just underneath the word monument, Above them is, is a dolmen, oh no, just at the end there, is the dolmen Lekadribeth. Now, if I stand at Lekadribeth and put my, um, or oh, stand at, stand at the, mon the monument behind me there. Take the microphone with you. Oh, Jesus. Well, why don't we get, why don't we get a radio mic? <laughs> These pe people are, so, this is not the right way to do it. I have to be able to move around and look at the slides. I have to be able to walk around and do a dance if I want to. <laughs> so, so just um, with the kindest will in the world, it just staggers at me that we haven't got that. All right? So here we, have, here we have an amazing set of circumstances. I can stand at that monument there and look at another monument that's to the left of it, and I can go up to Topakarn Ingley and look down at these monuments, and this will, that, that's Carn Ingley. Proto Stonehenge in Wales is designed to be a research paper that's got good graphics in it to allow people to enjoy reading it. They don't have to have all the technical stuff, but it's there. So, let's have a look at what some other people have said. One, an old friend, you'll like to see what has been said. A tradition which has been credited by many learned men over the centuries is that the ancients encoded their knowledge of the world in the dimensions of their sacred monuments. If that is so, any attempt to elicit that knowledge must be preceded by study of ancient metrology, for to interpret any set of dimensions, it is of course necessary to establish the lengths of unit of measure in which they were originally framed. Thanks, John. 
I'll buy that. He sat on a throne there, looking like someone off Last of the Summer Wine. <laughs> bless, bless him. Yeah, and a great man, one of the best friends I ever had in this business. So we can decide there and then that the big things that are missing in archaeology uh, are astronomy, geometry, and metrology, the three components the interconnection of all of them, the integration, is megalithic science. And Tom defined it in his books, but he never tried to... He was getting that old and his eyesight was going, and he never quite got to integrate it. Another ten years, he would have been OK. That's Carn Ingley in the background there, the, the, the volcano. Now, you can't miss that on the landscape, you would agree. It, it's the prevalent site. Lawrence Main has just told me he thinks it's the most important site in Wales, if not in England. There's a lot of energy around Carningley, and you can walk across the top of it, and there's all sorts of other things going on, which I can't talk about today. So let's look at how we start to integrate planetary motions with geometry and lens. Are you all interested in that? Yeah. Okay, right. So let's look, first of all, at something that John Martineau is particularly fond of, the dance of Venus. On the, on the slide here, you can see that if you were to make um, a circle, 13 units across, then the star arms are the same length to within 99.97% of the number of moons in a year. In one solar year, there are 12.368 um, uh, lunations. That's the full moon to full moon. We've just had an eclipse which is obviously a, a lunar eclipse, is a full moon. And we're about to go now into the dark age period in, in about 12 days' time. Every 584 days, Venus stops moving. 584 is phi, the number of the divine proportion, times 365. In eight years, Venus does this five times, creating a pentagon in space as seen from the Earth. And wooden books contain this diagram and variations of it lots of times because it's important. Now, in Oxford, I was doing a summer school for the Faculty of Astrological Studies some years ago, and I thought on the Sunday I'd better buy my wife a present because I've been away from home. So I went to the market and found a silver pendant with all the information or hints, not subtly, but very blatantly presented to me. There's the sun and the moon at the top. There's a, a pentagon star. The numbers are all there in the format of the thing. 2, 3, 5, 8, 10, 12, 13, and 29. These are all relevant to the subject. But the point is, it's, it's not a big pendant. This makes it look like it's the size of a small house. But it's actually um, uh, 1.3 uh, inches across. 1.3 inches across. 13. 13 units, and it's 1.3 inches across. Now, I don't understand why the jeweller made it that, but it is. And we've got a, go a goddess-like figure, a sort of serpentine hair job, hydra, and then you've got these trees, and there are a number of symbolisms all over it. But the fact is that you buy a pendant because you think it's lovely or it has an effect on you, but in fact, it's, it's all you need to know about Venus in, the, in a, in a single, single piece of jewellery. So the piece of jewellery is a wonderful thing, but what it's actually describing is an amazing thing, which is that people on the planet knew this sort of stuff a long time ago. Proving it's another matter. Let's go forward. So the prehistoric and ancient world engaged in a search for patterns in both time and space. Now the idea of using time, which is not a medium we can get grab hold of, it's the fourth dimension. We're all in a river called time flowing at the same rate which is, you don't, you, you can, like poo sticks, we're all poo sticks. Winnie the Pooh, you know the game? You played as a kid where you go to one side of the bridge upstream and you throw a twig in and the first one pass wins and pass it when you go to the other side of the bridge. You're familiar with that, some of you? Yeah. So, I'm a bit, I'm a bit old and people don't know what that's all about these days. But. Okay. Are we doing, a, are, we, are we fine? Right, let's have a look at this now. Let's look at the design of a type of circle, very popular throughout Britain, called a type B flattened circle. There's, there it is, um, and 
if you were to go to this, this is Long Meg, this particular circle, and that's the design that Alexander Tom defined by surveying about 15 or 20 of them in Britain in good condition. Long Meg is not in brilliant condition, but it does have the key points still there. And we see that the relationship of that right angle triangle is in that, the ratio numbers there, 18.618, 19.618, which leaves the third side by talking to Pythagoras and finding out is the result of the squares of these two numbers in a subtraction. So 19.618 squared minus 18.618 squared is 6.184 squared, and if the square root of it is the length, which is 6.184. Two of those make 12.367. Again, a very, very close approximation to the number of lunations in one year. The design's based on a vesica piscis, which is a fairly ancient <laughs> symbol of, of growth and birth for all reasons. We're, we're in the middle of nearly one of them in the cathedral here. It's a division of a line by three. There are three lines. You, that middle line across the horizontal there has two either side of it. So it's a third. So there's a three in there. Now, what does that tell you? It told me years and years ago when I started on this, and this is where my own involvement started, I found out that 19.618 times 18.618 is the solar year. It's 365.242 days. So in that triangle, we've got the solar year and the number of moons in the year. And that stone circle has held that as its secret ever since the people who built it weren't using it anymore or went away or whatever. And it's one of the earliest, according to Aubrey Burl, it's the, the Lake District circles are amongst the first stone circles put down in, in, in Britain. We can go further and we can look at other shapes. This is, these are triangles and a division of a line by three. Let's look at this one. The Chaldean order, which every astrologer learns when they're learning astrology, but no one learns it in physics, is that all, if you were to take a heptagram, a seven-sided figure, and put the planets in order of their, um, shown there, then you've got the days of the week on a plate, because if you go, I ought to really use this, if I can, and I'll try and stay near the microphone. I don't want to get hoarse. If we, take, if we say Sunday, which is today, and go down anti-clockwise down there, we end up at the moon. Sun, moon, Monday. Up to Mars, Tuesday, or Thor. Um, uh, well, Tui, the god of war in Iceland. And so there we go to Mercury, which is Wednesday, the market, Mercury. Then to Jupiter, which is Thor, Thursday. Then to Venus, Friday. Then to Saturn, Saturday, and then back to Sunday. This is, this again is a calendar. It's not accurate in terms of, it's based on a 13-month year where one year is 364 days, which apparently was extant in Britain till about the end of the 13th century. That's interesting material. But it relies on observation and measurement and a bit of knowledge of forbidden things like astrology, which as Brian Cox is constantly telling us is rubbish. Um, the observation of measurement and mensuration, which is the measurement of them, comes from the word moon. Moon and stone, mine, and metrology are all connected. And measurement in human history began with the observations of time and time recording. Professor Livio Stacchini, who was one of the, an Italian guy, who was one of the first people to kick archaeologists hard by following the metrological route of trying to understand monuments. Time, the fourth dimension, is non-material. Measurements of time were transduced into the spatial dimension, recorded as marked lengths of rope or regular notches in bone, way back in prehistoric times. Day inches or day feet counting have been found at major sites, suggesting an immense history of use for these units of length. We've also got some weirdness that crops up from time to time, and, and you know, I know there's plenty of people here who love this stuff, the sun and the moon revealing how to square the circle by area. If we take 18.618, that number we had before, that's the length of time for the moon's cycle of risings and settings to complete itself. 
So it's the periodic time of the moon's uh, rising. We're coming up to the major standstill now. So the moon is oscillating between very high and very low, as you might notice in the sky if you look at the moon, depending on which signs it's in. It's very high always in Cancer and very low when it's down in Capricorn. And, and it's getting to the biggest disparity between new and full moon that you're going to get in, in a year's time. The sun, meantime, has a repeat cycle of 33 years, where if you multiply the solar year, the, the one on your calendar, and get it accurate to five decimal places, which you can get from any book on physics, it will tell you that 33 times the solar year, it comes back to rise and set in exactly the same place. Those two numbers, when you put them together, 33 squared, which you have to do for the circle, the square, and 18.618 squared, which you have to do for the area of the circle, give us areas that are, you can find pi in the, in the formulae, and, and this is a, a very useful mnemonic or tool for storing cosmological information. Now, if you're not familiar with those time periods and you come across an artifact with that shape in it and you don't measure it and you wouldn't do or you don't measure it, you measure it in metres which is, you're going to lose the plot um, you're going to be disappointed but from my side of the fence if I, I can work with this I find clever connections which is Tom's they are more superior than I am the people who design this idea and how it fits, and that's, it's not my own imagination, these things exist. And then from this we get the game of solitaire, which is, could almost mean the weight of the sun, or the measure of the sun in French, sol and terre. Um, playing game, 33 cycles, which is the number of pe pegs, and the repeat cycle of the sun's rising, of which there are 12,053 in the 33 years, and we've already said 18.61 years is the repeat cycle of the moon's rising and setting point. Now that equals 6,000 naught naught days. Remember that number, 6,800 days is the time of the 18.618 cycle. We'll come back to it. All right, so uh, that's the same slide. That shouldn't be there. Okay, in English feet, the, if we look at the meridian, the north-south meridian, the, in, and they look on Google, uh, any map, any admiralty map which has navigational stuff on it, you will find that the, in English feet, 24,883.2 miles is that number of feet, that long number I won't repeat, in geographical remens, which is an Egyptian unit of length, this same length is 108 million Greek remens. Now, the remen is just five-sixths of a foot, basically. There are variants of it, but that's... 108 is the number of the Earth. In all the traditional numerology, and that's the number of the Earth, and there we have it, coming out of this. One of Plato's special numbers, and it's the polar circumference in units of geographical rev. Interesting? Yeah? Okay. Now let's look at the equator. Now the equator is the only true circle because the Earth has a bulge and it's sort of a slightly bulging out as many of us are when we get into middle age. Uh, but it is a true circle. And if you go on any website, you'll find, if you, for the uh, circumference, they will give you a length of 2,402 miles. So they vary. Amazing. Over all the physics, there's quite a wide variety of websites that give a slightly different one. Yeah. Now, John Michel points out that a famous sinologist, that's a person who doesn't collect road signs, but uh, studies China, Sino in the sense of China, discovered that in the Yellow River area, in prehistoric times, uh, they had divided the equatorial circumference into 365 and a quarter divisions. This can only mean that they understood the length of the year because you wouldn't pick a quarter, but an astronomer would have loved to have 
you had that as a, 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 as a clock reference for studying the risings and settings. And then if you then use geographic remnants, you get this number underneath, which is almost the uh, 1,008085404.5, but it's also the number of 13 lunar, 13 lunar months is 13.368 lun um, traverses of the sky, and the lunar month, 12 of them, is the year. This is, so 13.368 moons is 13 lunar months, 0.368. We get 12.368, in a year of the, of, the, of the moon's phases, the phase of the moon. This is the moon's transit past a fixed star. The, the upper figure is the figure past a fixed star. Now, there's a lot of information to take on here, but it, it's all... All you need to know is that that number there is remarkable, and yet no, it isn't being picked up. It's fairly new information, as far as I know. But if you look at that, num that fraction there, then it, you're going to find something very remarkable comes out, which is that it, because it contains that, this division gives you, in the shape of the Earth, the two things you need to know about the Moon. It's sidereal, or star orbit, and also it's monthly, or yearly, the annual one, where it changes its phases. It's contained in that number. And that fraction does it for me. It's a big deal. Because it says that you've got not only the, the days of the year, but you've got all the lunar information contained in the, in the design of our planet or the design of the, of the way the measurements are configured. That is the amazing thing. And I don't expect all of you to immediately understand the significance of that. But the implications are massive. Because if someone in prehistory was doing that, as the sin famous sinologist, whose name escapes me, but it shouldn't, but uh, when you're delivering a lecture, it's amazing how often there's an empty drawer when you pull on the, the, the front of it. Um, I forget his name. Very famous. He's a top, top sinologist. Who was? Joseph Needham. Joseph Needham. That's it. Right. Okay, thank you. I'll take my amnesia pill later. Um, let's look at change and look at station stone rectangle at Stonehenge. This is the four stones. There's only two of them left now, but the positions of the other two are measured very carefully by Richard Atkinson and other people. It's an, based around a 300, um, a, a 5, 12, 13 triangle. You can go to Stonehenge, as I do with groups, and measure the, the bottom 12 side is the one to measure because you can gain access to the hole where the, the other stone was. And that stone at the top left there, uh, on the, the left-hand side there, is still extant. Every year they're removing by, not let, by letting the grass grow over the Aubrey Circle because it's somehow they don't like people looking at it. I don't know who's that I've written and nobody gave a replies. That's a better picture of it, perhaps. It shows people on how it would look on the ground before they built all the middle, the rubble that's in the middle of Stonehenge. <laughs> um, and that was built about 3,100 BC. So we, we can look at that, and we can look at the diagonals and the five side, and we've got the measurements in feet. So we, we, we can perceive that that, which is 12 lunar months, is a little bit longer. There's about... Uh, a third of a flutney. We all know what that is, a thrupney piece, a flutney and piece. And, and if we were to do, measure that and put it level, and if we were then to put 13 lunar months down, which is quite a lot longer, you got it? You see that difference? See the, the three? Everybody yeah. all right with that? And we were to fasten a piece of rope here and lift them so that one of them, all three are vertically in a straight line, you've created a lunation triangle, and it's created automatically. The right angle is automatic. If that, 
those three, you can put a ruler straight on those three. Two pints of ale, wasn't it? Now, I can't give you a better representation of how simple that is. Because in, in the field, you can build one of these as big as you want. And at Stonehenge, if you thought that you couldn't do this, it makes the right angle automatic. If you do it with rope, and you swing the rope around this one, and down to here, this, we have three points in the pegs in the earth, and to take a rope up and swing it round to there, then it's automatically going to create the right angle. We don't have to have a protractor. We make a 90 degree angle there. And then we've got this middle one representing the solar year, which is a calendar already calibrated in lunar months. So we get the sun and the moon in the calendar, which we don't have in our shitty old Roman calendar, which is basically the moon's been kicked out because they, they didn't like women, especially Druid women. You kill them if you meet them. In Britain, anyway. I'm sorry. You, it's not quite as mobile as I hoped. So to get the message across to you, and we have plenty of time, then th this is a technology that is easily doable with wood or rope. And we know that, that oh, prehistoric people in Neolithic time had rope. We can now go and see this in action somewhere else. If we go to France and down to Karnak, there was a... <laughs> oh, bless. The, 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 quadrilatère, the Quadrilatère de Manio is a site in, um, just near Karnak. Uh, and if we look next door to it, there's a site there that is unique and very useful to, to my work. And um, it was Howard Crowhurst that took us there first. Um, although I had visited the site before, but I, hadn't, I didn't spend much time there. It was a bit of a... I didn't really have the knack of getting a can opener on the site, if you like, and I didn't have a theodolite at the time. So th there's sort of a, a lot going on here. There's carved stones, you can see. Uh, there's some weirdness halfway along, but it, it's a long, more or less straight line. It's contiguous. It goes both sides, and there's measurements being done at the site. Uh, and in long grass, you can't see the other row in the back. Um, and it proved to be a, a bit of a groundbreaker because th this one works. There's a, I did a survey in 2008 with my brother Richard. Uh, we went out there. And, and that's, the, that's my survey plan. Alexander Tom did one, but he, he didn't take long enough to do it. Um, and he, he says this in one of his in notes. Um, I had a week to do it, and we managed to use the sun as a reference, which is always better. We get the angle right and everything. And that's it. And it's a four by one square. And in fact, if you look at this diagram I've just done, it's another way of extracting the um, lunar year and mix, integrating it with... We don't have to make a 5, 12, 13. But there is one from the, from the top, from the bottom line there. If you drop a vertical and come across, it's a 5, 12, 13. So you, you, you eventually have to get the same uh, numbers out of it. And, and there's... The midsummer sunrise is a, another thing going on the top there. But there's a whole lot of stuff. Uh, but the interesting thing is, it's in day, a day is at one inch in this monument. The English inch. Not the French units. Not, the, not, the me, not metric, it's, it's one inch. And it's very accurate. And so that was part of my growth. Uh, and expanded me across the ocean to France. Karnak is a wonderful place. You should visit it, all of you. It'll keep you going for a week. And the French don't really know what they've got on their hands, I don't think, because you ride around in a Disneyland train on a little truck to go and see the sights. It's a bit naff. Um, now let's look at something else that will perhaps blow you away. Some of the earlier circles that I mentioned earlier, Long Meg, are connected to Castle Rig in um, a form of a double square. Now, this was forced, first brought to me by Ewan Mackay. We actually went and had a day trip with sandwiches and ale to, to both sites, and we, we talked about it quite a lot. 
uh, about 1978 or something, so, no, 88 it was. And so this is quite a, uh, an interesting thing because it's exact. The top corner, long megs at one and long castle rigs at the other. If we take that line backwards across the landscape, we end up at South Barrel, which we've got someone in the audience who knows where that is. Is Matt there? You've been to South Barrel. It's a great big unavoidable megalithic site on the top of a high mountain on the Isle of Man. Well, that's, that's, that line continued, goes through that site. If we look at the measurements here, which I like to do, and this was not done immediately, because I didn't know really about the metrology and how to do that at that time. But anyway, the, the measurements were just recorded as numbers. There they are. Uh, and uh, recorded, or each one of the squares there has a side length of 45, 747 feet. Now this turns out to be um, one eighth of a degree of longitude um, at this site. So that we have a site here that's recording, uh, a look, uh, obviously as it involves surveying, that does things that are connected with the size of the earth because you have to measure the angle for the angle of the, of the um, uh, longitude and latitude and they're more or less very similar and so uh, those numbers are, uh, are the numbers that measure on Google Earth you might like to try that yourself at home connect the two up we've been to the two other corners and there's not much there one's been ruined by agriculture and the other side there's a forest built there which doesn't bode well and is also privately owned with a, an owner that didn't really want to be involved um, so we we can look now if we found that as an example it looks like i'm i'm saying to you look someone was surveying up north in the lake district these are 3000 bc and it's got the Coincidentally, in any units, it's going to be a unit of, of one-eighth of a degree. And, and we'll, we'll forget the diagonal at this point. But look at this. Here's another one that I discovered, more or less at the same period. I used to fish for mackerel near this nuclear power plant at Sylcroft, which, in retrospect, was perhaps a bit foolish and might explain a lot of what's gone funny with my life. <laughs> I glow in the dark, you know. My teeth drop out every year. There we are. But there are three sites that have exactly, or almost exactly, the same numerology built into them. Greycroft, which is known as Sylcroft, used to be known as Sylcroft, and, some, and that, that's right up next to the nuclear power station. That's that great big beige-coloured abomination that is above there. And then we've got a right angle at Burnmore East, and we come down to Swinside, which some people will know as Sunken Kirk, which is a a very beautiful site to visit, and the, the side lengths are clearly related to the previous slide. If we go back, oops, if we go back, then that's, you can, they're clearly related. I haven't drawn them to scale, but it doesn't matter. So, that we find two examples. Now, what was going on? Why are these there? And you could say, well, there's lots of, of stone circles in the Lake District. Why don't all of them do it? Well, I think you only need these two to, to make a point, and we don't want to waste time, and time presses on. There's a, a long meg, megalith is separate from the, the type B, and it has all these spiral diagrams on, that mark, and it marks the winter solstice from the middle of the monument, looking into Hel Helvellyn, which is a, a long level, flat uh, summit of a, of a very high mountain in the Lake District. There are three big stones, uh, well, more than three big stones, but there's two huge stones in Long Meg that actually are more or less aligned east-west. They're not, it's not exact. They are, they, they are, I could show you by going back, I can't go back because I'm not confident I'll do it capably. So let's look at look what really is the, the, the meat in the sandwich here. Those stones, if you stand next to them, they're enormous. They're, they're eight foot deep, nine foot deep, ten foot deep, I don't know. I ought to. But it, the inward measurement is 365.25. Uh, 
I think we know what that is. As you go through, it's recorded by Tom that he measured, because he did the midpoints of the stones, it's recorded as 360 feet. And the outer one, uh, the, sorry, the inner one is, <laughs> the outer one is 365, the middle one is uh, 360, but the inner two edges are the length of a lunar year, 354.3 feet. Now, anybody can go to this site and do that measurement with little more than a juice and 100 foot tape, which you peg every 100 feet till you get to the other side. And it's all there. And they're the two most prominent stones on the, uh, in the building of it. And then we've got this mark down to, down to uh, Helvellyn. Now, there's other things going on. There's Woodhenge, near Stonehenge. It's been there for years. The, an air light, uh, light aircraft, military aircraft, taking photographs in the 20s, spotted what they thought were marks and reported it to Maud Cunningham and her husband, uh, who were expert archaeologists and from Wales, by the way. And they decided that they would uh, oh, have a big dig there, which they did in around 1927. Uh, for a lot, quite a long period because the, obviously the, you can't do th much in the winter. I think they came for two summers, got a lot of information together and discovered this multi-posted shape which Alexander Tom identified a, a 12, 35, 37 triangle was the foundation of it. And all of these are in megalithic yards and you'll have to get, get the map for yourself and have a look. That's not what I want to talk about today. What I want to talk about is it's absolutely incredible that nobody has been to Stonehenge and measured the distance of the centre of that point to Stonehenge. If they did that, they would find it's 10,033 feet, which means nothing to most people. In any measurement, it wouldn't be immediately obvious. But the point is, it's the 13th side of a triangle, 5, 12, 13, that goes east-west from Stonehenge, for the 12 side, and then north-south. So Stonehenge is connected to this site through a 5, 12, 13 triangle. I have no idea how it was used, but it's there. Now, the other interesting thing is that the unit length of the triangle, each one of those 30 units that define the 5 plus 12 plus 13, each one of those individual unit lengths is 283.6 megalithic yards. That's the same as the number of feet in the Aubrey Circle average diameter, which in feet is 283.6 feet. Voila! I put it on the website, on my website, and I have had no responses whatsoever. So I, I think this, this is ahead of any future interest in the subject. We can look at some more. Everybody all right? Right, this is Carningley Summit, where there is a little seat to sit. So level I can put my theodolite on it and use it. And you can see this gentleman lying down with a big nose. Um, and then if you see the little chevron, you can see another little uh, cairn, in, which is dark on the horizon. And behind that, if you can see it from by the back, you've got good eyesight. But there's two peaks that form a, like a little egg cup. And on that point, that point, if you view the sun setting, only on one day in a year will it set in the egg cup. And it's February the 18th. Does it in October the 25th, in the autumn? It has two cracks at it. But the February the 18th is, uh, 18th is very interesting because where that happens, those, those mountains are right next to St. David's. And St. David's Day is March the 1st. But unfortunately, the year changes, the calendar changed between when they gave him his sainthood and what we see now. And in fact, it was 11 days out. So you add 11 days to February the 18th and you get March the 1st, St. David's Day. So this is a wonderful way of calibrating a calendar. You, you know the day of the equinox. Only on the day of the equinox in the spring does it do that. 
You can get further than that. There's a little variation over four years that you can actually see. But I just wanted to leave you with the fact that there is this going on throughout Britain and throughout Europe, and it's the same stuff. And it's all to do with putting planet Earth and the moon and the sun into some form of harmonic arrangement that's understanding requires you mix time and space together. And if you do that, you'll find the same things crop up all the time. Here's the other triangle from Carningley, the one I did with the pointing, when I went over there and did the silly bit about voice and things. That's Lekadribe. There's Carningley. Look at the top of Lekadribe. From that position, it's pretty good, you can see. You can see that there's intervisibility. Down, that's the, that, that is the 13th side of the triangle. Kriegai Kemais is three ruined cairns, ruined by a farmer with a Fergie tractor in 1949 trying to get rid of rabbits who fell very ill very quickly afterwards and died three years afterwards. A warning to all of us. And there's a trig point on the left-hand one. That's the point I'm interested in. That's the bit you see from Carningley really clearly. And then finally we've got Carningley, so if you put those together, we end up with a 512-13 triangle and I've got the original diagram I drew on my drawing board the afternoon, the wet after, Sunday afternoon after I arrived at the figures for it. That's the original diagram, 2013. There it is, done on a map with the angles written on. So the data's there. It's to, we could argue about fractions of a percentage, but basically that looks as though that's a, a real one. And when you look at the scaling factor between the two triangles and the Stonehenge, station stone rectangles, the, the one that with the 5, 12, 13 in the station stones, the scaling factor is 1 to 88.59. Meant nothing immediately, but it's actually three lunar months in days. Exactly. So we've got here all sorts of numeric connections. Now, have I got a few minutes longer? Yes. Yeah. We, yesterday you listened to Vince... Uh, the, uh, Gaffney, yeah. Unusual surname, I should have remembered. Who, with, because he's been involved in this discovery of huge chalk pits near Durrington Walls. And it's never mentioned in any of the reports that this shape that he's got here, the shape that you see with the red dots around, that it actually is just nothing, uh, is almost identical to a, a type of circle that Alexander Tom identifies. It's, it's got interesting geometry. So my geometry, which I wrote in the article on my website, which you're all welcome, free to go and have a look at, is, 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 is that it's based on this design. It's an ellipse or a, a cut-off circle. Uh, and if you follow that geometry with using that and that smaller circle, you go around the corner, the straight bit. So dotted lines show a rope that moves around. You really need a smaller group and I need to, you need to do it in the field, really. Um, and then we've got this sort of extended circle. And if you, that's a very close approximation to the stones he's got. But no mention is made of this in the archaeological report. So we can superimpose that on the landscape. And then what we can do is we can compare it to a site in the Procellis, which is a, about 130, 40 miles away. That's a site that I surveyed called Casteth Mauer. It's bigger than Stonehenge. It's, it's a stone... You, there it is. It's a henge with, a, with a, a, a deep trough round the outside of it. The hedge is later. We forget the middle chevron. It's not, it wasn't part of the original thing. There's, the, there's the, how that works with an ellipse at the back, but exactly the same principle, an equilateral triangle, placed in the right positions. And if we look at that and we go back and we start looking at it closely, we can put the two together. Now, there has to be more than coincidence that they are so similar in the idea, the form of the design of this thing. So, ipso facto, whoever designed Casteth Mauer, which is older, took a, had a hand in that. So we could... I could say a lot of things about it, but right now, this thing, this shape on the left here, has uh, 
a number thing that's all to do with the sun and the moon. And finally, we'll look at latitude. There are three main attitude bands that are of interest. Stonehenge, ooh, Stonehenge, Karnak, and up Arbolo and Bryn Kethi, and then we go in the English lakes. Cres Kakuna in Brittany, it's a square. It's a stone circle that's a square. It's, it's a bit odd. It's, it's the Aquarian stone circle. Um, if we actually measure this, whoop, it makes a 5 4 3 triangle. Uniquely at that latitude, a 5 4 3 triangle gives you the, these angles here, which, co not coincidentally, define your four important solar points the point of the midwinter sunrise. There we are. Oh, it did it by itself then. Uh, this, thank you. Um, winter sunrise, summer sunset. You've got it all there in one monument. And it's right at the right latitude. I think Tom says it's within three miles of being perfectly on the right. But I think we can, we can say that that's fairly good. Finally, and I want to finish on this one, there's another, an equinoctial sunset, that's east-west, from Wine Mound, all this fuss about Wine Mound. Now, Wine Mound Circle, never mind what you've heard Alice Roberts tell us, the four remaining stones are prime data. That one's standing. There's a recumbent where that post sticking up in the middle of the stone is. And there are two other stones. One's a stump and there's another recumbent. But you can see where the holes were. And, there, and if you get a rope and you guess where the centre might be and frig about for a couple of hours. In my case, my wife and I swearing at each other because it's a big distance and you can't hear because of the wind and the, the wire keeps getting snagged on heather and the rope gets... It's, it's really not as easy as you think, working with women. <laughs> but I'm not sexist, because it's equally bad for them. Because we get ratty. Of course it is, dear. So there we are. That post sticking, that post in the middle there is at the other stone. And that's the sunset into the stone, and it, the final flash is over that post. Now, I had a tinge of a premonition that that might be re related to the actual morning of the, solstice, of the equinox when suddenly uh, the sun rises you can see fog in the valleys there and then you can see the sun rising and it's rising over a, a place called Voile Dragan and they missed this on the programme this site is all about equinox because that angle is exactly opposite the other angle. So the height of the horizon where that other post was stuck is just making it, which is not common, making it a 180 degree difference, which has got to be, one feels, deliberate. If you actually do a rope from the centre and get it right to these four stones, prime data, they're not dug up, they're still in the original positions, except they've fallen over, but the holes are visible. I got... A group of 10 children on a, a gig that I did for the Pembrokeshire Parks, a day out where, with novelty item, you know. And I gave them two, two teams, always good to create competition, cooperation. Uh, gave them ropes and said, now look, both of, all of you settle down and get, get measured. You've got to get the point in the ground where you go over the middles of the, sto the four stones that remain. They did it in, uh, with fun and with much humour in about an hour and a half. And from that, we deduced, and it was amazing, the, the radius of that circle is 141.8 feet. So 141.9 and a half inches. Right, both teams got it within an inch and a half. We sunk a peg with my, uh, and a piece of sheet lead and an iron nail so we could pick it up with a compass so it was buried, not visible. Now, they've made a mess of the site, the archaeologists, I have to say. They haven't cleared up after themselves very well. Um, I think it's shortage of money, I'm told. Um, right. But what's 141.8 times 2? I can hear the rust. It's like putting the brakes on, on the bike after a long winter. Well, it's 283.6. 
So its radius, its diameter of the circle, is the same as the Aubrey circle. So Mike Parker Pearson, who doesn't do above ground, has got his connection with Stonehenge through measurement. Now, this is an important point. I'm going to finish on this point. It's an important thing that's going on here, which is that this stone circle, the existing few stones that are left, quite clearly give us a length without me nudging. It was all filmed. I didn't give them a figure beforehand. These kids were between 9 and 12 years old. They were running about giggling and all that and they were being naughty and things, but they got it done and they found that length, not me. Right, so it was all filmed and the National Park got a copy, no doubt. And so I'm going to leave you with this fact. If a 10-year-old kid can find the diameter of a circle, why is it that Parker Pearson finds one 360 feet in diameter, which you, no way can that rope fit round the curve then. It's, 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 not, it's not right. And so I, I would challenge that and with data. And it's called, it's called alternative data. And it's not I'm getting at anybody. I just want people to see that there is more to this than was on that documentary. And no one covered the equinoctial thing, which is obvious if you live there and you go up and walk there as often as I do. I mean, I actually measured that diameter badly, I have to say, in the early 90s. But there are only four stones. And I thought, oh, it's not going to be anything relevant. I didn't really... And it, it, so it proved. But, but I obviously missed a, a great opportunity then. So I want to leave you with the idea that you can do these things. You. Because you're not getting, going to get any support at the moment from the state or from the state's organisation. I, I stressed it yesterday. You got the message. It's up to you to do these things and to start to get our true history. And if you don't do that, it's, it's a big, big disappointment. So there's a pile of books. I, I'm not theoretically allowed to sell them anymore because I was closed down by the tax people for not being able to fill in a tax return properly. But, but they don't know that we're still on dial-up and their form doesn't... You can't get their form to... To, to come down properly. Our slowest, slowest e email in, in the country, website. It's really slow. Less than a meg all the time. On a wet Sunday, it goes down to about a quarter of a meg. Um, so you try take, sending a one meg document to people. You need an alarm clock and a sleeping bag. So there we are. Those are the books. Thank you for listening to me. And I've really enjoyed the dialogue we've had with the individuals that have spoken to me. And you've been a great audience. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.